this series that we have been in called Come Holy Spirit. It's been so good. It's been so rich. It's just blessed me. Anytime we begin to talk about the topic of the Holy Spirit, I just get all excited because he is so great in our lives and wants to produce so much in our life. In week one, if you missed it, week one, we talked about the Spirit led life. And Pastor John the preached that message, and it was so great, about how we should be led by the Spirit. And in week two, we talked about a Spirit-filled life. Not only should we be led by the Spirit, but we should also be filled with the Spirit of God. And boy, we need that. How many of you know we need to be filled with the Spirit of God? So good. And so today, I'm going to be speaking to you the third installment of that series, and I'm going to simply title it, I've Got the Power. Yeah. Will you look at the person next to you and say, I've got the power. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Amen. Now, <laughs> as I was preparing for this message I was reminded of a conversation that I had with someone from another country. They were actually from Nigeria. And I like to talk with, to people from other countries because I like to hear what they're talking about and what, what, how things are in other countries, the culture, the food, what's different. And this person lived in Nigeria for many years, and then they also lived in America. So it was very intriguing to me to talk to this person about what life was like. And I said, what's the difference between Nigeria and America. And I thought they were going to tell me, obviously, something about the language or the food or whatever. And they said, you know what the biggest difference in Nigeria and America is that America has consistent power. And I thought, what do you mean by that, consistent power? They said that the utilities are always on in America. <laughs> I said, really? They said, no, in Nigeria, what they do is, is every single day, it'll happen today, every single day at some point without any notification, the power just goes out for 12 to 18 hours. And you just have to deal with it. And so I went and looked it up because I thought, no way this can be serious. And I went and looked it up and it's called a rolling blackout. And what they do is, is that they rolling, they, they have this time where they turn off the lights in certain grids so the entire grid wouldn't block out. And I thought to myself, that has to be completely frustrating. Can you imagine a mom cooking in the kitchen and all of a sudden as she's cooking, just pew, power just goes out. Or, or a dad watching his favorite show and then pew, there's the power. Or a kid playing a video game, he's on the last level and he's ready to win it. Power just out. And I went, man, how frustrating can that be? And listen, if there's anybody who knows about power outages, we know about power outages in Louisiana. Am I right? Oh, my gosh. Uh, hurricanes come. I remember doing Gustav. We were out of power for two weeks at my home. And I'm telling you, I had a meltdown. I mean, literally, I was telling my wife, I can't take it anymore. I just can't. Why? Because I don't like to be without power. I value power. Yeah. But something that I realize is this, is that one of the things that happens when you don't have power is that, first of all, you may get a little frustrated, but the second thing happens is that you become adjusted to not having power. You start to understand, you start to learn how to live in those moments without power. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and said that oftentimes churches and even believers have started to begin to adjust and learn how to live without power. We, we have gotten to a place where we've learned how to do church so well. We've learned how to, to, to do the program so well that we forget that the, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us power and we need the power of the Holy Spirit. As believers, we've learned how to just live life and go about life, and we've forgotten what it's like to live with the Holy Spirit and power and what he does and how he empowers us. And today, my prayer for you when you leave here today is that you don't leave here without power. My prayer is that you say, Holy Spirit, I need your power in every area of my life. 
And that's what we're going to be talking about today. There's three simple things that I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to empower us to do. And I'm going to give you those. They're going to be on the screen. But it's a scripture I want to read before we get into that. It's in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Two scriptures, Luke chapter 24, verse 49. First of all, it says, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city. Now, I don't have time to preach this stay here part. I wish I did because that's a whole other message because sometimes I feel like we move so quickly that we can miss the Holy Spirit speaking to us. But we've got to learn how to stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says this, and this is what Jesus told him right before he was leaving. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling, every, telling about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said this as he was getting ready to depart earth. He was getting ready to ascend to heaven. And he thought to himself, what do these disciples need before I leave? What is the last thing I can tell them? What can I give them before they leave? If they're going to turn the world upside down, what do they need? They need power. They need the Holy Spirit in power. What made Jesus different than every other teacher that walked the earth? It was the power that he walked in. It was the Holy Spirit and power. There were a lot of teachers that were there. There were a lot of great teachers who taught in the synagogue, but there were not a lot of teachers who we saw hands that were withered be, coming, coming to life and, and people who were sick being healed. Why? Because Jesus walked in the Holy Spirit and power. And so we need the Holy Spirit to empower us in these areas in our life. Can I give you three things right now? The first thing that the Holy Spirit will do is that he will empower you to live a godly life. As Christians, we, we're, we're told that we should live a godly life, and we desire to live a godly life. At least most of us do. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, it says that they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. So stay away from people like that. Because there are some people who want to just be religious. But we have to learn how to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to make us godly. To live a godly life. So what does a godly life look like? I'm glad you're asked. Well, a godly life looks like being able to have the power to overcome temptations. Oh, I know we all deal with things. And we, listen, we can come in here and we can act real holy and, and act like God is doing so much in our life. But we're all dealing with some sort of temptation. The enemy throws things at us. And there's things that we can struggle with at times. But that's why we need the Holy Spirit to empower us to overcome those temptations. It's important for us to understand that. And when the Holy Spirit begins to do that, you can begin to say, hey, you know what? I am moving into a different place, and I don't have to struggle with the things that I've been struggling with. Can I just give you this? I want you to understand that the power of the Holy Spirit gives you power to conquer things that you've been coping with. I want you to understand that because there's things that you, you've been coping with and saying, well, you know, I'm going to always deal with this alcoholism. I'm going to always deal with this struggle. There's these things I watch that I'm, I've tried to break. But this is what I've learned is that willpower isn't good enough. It's not. And, and look, I've tried things, and I've tried to say, well, I'm going to will it right. And, and yes, I, you know, I get it. There's sometimes there's the 12-step programs and all that, and all that stuff is good. I believe in all that. But what I really believe in is the power of the Holy Spirit because he is the one that can help you break those struggles and break those things, and you can conquer those things because in that you can begin to live a godly life. As you begin to live a godly life and overcome those things, the second thing I begin to understand is that you become an example to your friends and family. Because let me just say this, 
The people who know you the best and know if you're safe for real are the ones that's close around you. That's the reason why you were hesitant to tell them that you were saved when you first got saved. Because they begin to start to see if you were really saved. Your friends and family begin to understand, hey, uh, no, let me just check and see what's going on with them. Are you really serving the Lord like you say that you're serving the Lord? And when we have the power of the Holy Spirit, it allows people to begin to move and begin to say, hey, you know what? I am walking in the power, and, and I know that I can be a godly example in, a, in front of my friends and my family. Yeah. I think about my brother. I have two younger brothers, and my two younger brothers, when they gave their heart to Jesus, they were 14 and 13 years old. I wasn't saved at the time. And they gave their heart to Jesus at a camp just like uh, uh, at Bethany, and just like the camp they were just talking about on the screen. And as I would watch them, I would look at what their life was doing, and, and I saw what was happening. They were changing. My 14-year-old brother, he was getting in drugs, and he was fighting in school, and he was doing bad in, in, on his, in his grades. And, and all of a sudden, he gave his heart to Jesus, and after school, he was coming home, and he would go to his room, and he would pray for an hour. 14 years old. Hey, 14-year-old kids don't do that. They come home and they eat when they get home from school. <laughs> they watch television. But I begin to watch him go in his room and pray. And I watch my youngest brother begin to give his heart to Jesus and all these things. And, and as I was watching them, I begin to say, you know, there's something different about them. There's something different about them. And one Wednesday night, I brought them to church, just bringing them to church. And I gave my heart to Jesus. And I'm telling you, it wasn't what was said, it was the example that was set before me. Living a godly life. And then when you live a godly life, this is the other thing that I've learned about living a godly life, then you can live a godly life with longevity. And this is why I honor people who've been serving the Lord for 20 and 30 and 40 years. I want to take a moment and honor all of our prime timers who've been serving the Lord for 20 and 30 and 40 years and been giving their heart to Jesus for a long time. Thank you for what you've done at all of our campuses. Why? Because we look up to you because you're not a flash in the pan. You've been somebody who's been serving just Jesus and been consistent. And the only way you can do that is with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowering you to live a godly life. And I'm so grateful for that. The second thing that the Holy Spirit will empower you to do is that he will give you power for miracles. This is what I believe. I believe miracles are still for today. I don't know how you believe. I know some people think that miracles are just for in the Bible or back in the day. But I believe miracles still happen. As a matter of fact, I actually went and looked it up and, and did a little study on it, and a study said that 80% of Americans still believe in miracles, eight out of 10 people. Why aren't we seeing it happen as much as we would like to see it happen? It's because we need the Holy Spirit to empower us. We begin to adjust without power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need him to begin to move in our life. I think about, I think about, Peter and John, as they were going to pray, and you know the story of the, the lame person that was asking for money, and I love what Peter and John said in Acts chapter 3, verse 6, he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, catch this, but what I do have, what did he have? He had the Holy Spirit and power. He said, what I do have, I give to you, and then he told him to rise up and walk. See, miracles begin to happen when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. God desires people to be healed and miracles to take place. We just have to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 8, verse 46, it's the story of the woman with the issue of blood. We all are familiar with that story. And the woman with the issue of blood reached down and she touched the hem of his garment. And this is what I love what Jesus said. He says, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Yeah. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that changes things and changes a situation and heals people. 
As a matter of fact, at the end of this service, we're going to pray for miracles to take place because I still believe in miracles. Can somebody say amen? amen. I'm reminded of a guy on staff. He injured his knee playing football with some students. He probably shouldn't have been out there playing himself anyway. He's probably too old for that. Not me. I'm not talking about myself. But he was out there playing, and he injured his knee pretty bad. I mean, it was swollen. He could barely walk. But he came to work one morning, and he was just telling us how bad his knee was. And he tried to go get it x-rayed, and they said, we can't even x-ray it because it's so swollen right now. He said, man, I don't know if I'm going to have to have surgery. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so we said, all right, let's get together and let's pray for you. And the pastors began to lay their hands on his knees. And as they prayed, you could see him, something was beginning to happen. And he said, I feel heat in my knee right now. And at that moment, God healed his knee. And I'm telling you, he's been changed ever since. Never had to go back to the doctor. Never had to have surgery. Why? Because God healed him. Because the power of God still heals. The power of God also gives authority over the enemy. I want you to understand that you can walk in authority over the enemy, that you don't have to take what the enemy is throwing you away. You can walk in authority over the enemy. Can I just tell you something? You have power to change atmospheres when you walk in there. When you go to work on, on Monday, you have the power to, with the Holy Spirit to change the entire atmosphere. You have the power to change the atmosphere at your home. I know it feels like there's depression and, and oppression at your home. You ought to walk in there filled with the Holy Spirit and say, no, something's about to change in here. Because I am filled with the power. I have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have authority. And then there's power gifts that are released when we begin to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just special gifts of faith, special gifts of healing and the working of miracles. This happens when we understand that there's power in miracles, and finally, there is power to have courage. When I believe, what I believe is that as we get to a place, we start to say, you know what, Holy Spirit, empower me to share my faith and tell other people about you. Then we start to think in our mind, you know what? I can have boldness to tell other people about Jesus. I don't have to get to a place where I'm just, I'm just sitting around and I'm just keeping what, what God has done in my life. I can have boldness to tell other people about the Lord. I believe that Jesus told the disciples that the Holy Spirit is going to come and give you power because he knew that the gospel rested on their shoulders. And he knew that if they were going to go, they had to spread the gospel everywhere. And they needed boldness and courage to spread the gospel everywhere. What keeps us from spreading the gospel? It's really fear. Am I right? Yeah, it's fear of man, fear of rejection. That's the thing that keeps us from spreading the gospel. And that's the reason why Paul told Timothy, he says, For God is, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Power, love, and self-discipline. I remember giving my heart to Jesus when I did. And I had some friends that I hung around when I gave my heart to Jesus. And again, I was a little afraid to tell them that I gave my heart to the Lord. So I just kept acting like everything was cool and without telling them anything was different. And I remember my friend that I played basketball with. Matter of fact, he's here today sitting on the second row. We've been friends for 20 years. And I remember him looking at me and said, Wayne, something's different about you. We were in his mom's home, and we were sitting in the living room, and he said, what's different about you? And I said, what do you mean? He said, man, I'm telling you, you're acting different. You're not doing the same things that you used to do. You're not saying the same things you used to say. What is different about you? And I didn't want to do it, but I felt the power of the Holy Spirit come upon me. 
and this courage and boldness to step up and say, you know what? Jesus has changed my life. He's changed my life. And I felt this courage come over me. And I remember in that moment, he looked at me. And I didn't know what he was going to say. But he looked at me and he said, man, if he changed your life, you think he can change mine? And I said, yeah, man. And we prayed right there in his mom's living room. And for the last 20 years, he's been serving the Lord, and he's sitting in here today, and I'm so grateful for my friend being here. The power of the Holy Spirit, that's what he wants to do. So you say, well, Pastor, how, how do I apply this? Because I hear you talking about how the Holy Spirit gives us power. How do I apply? I'm glad you asked this question, too, because I have... An illustration here. I know you've been wondering what this lamp is all about. <laughs> but this cord right here, it represents power. It's lit up. So I know that there is power flowing through here. I would not put a fork in here right now. <laughs> because this represents power. The first thing I want you to understand as we apply this message is that you have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Every single person in this room has access to it. It's available for you. I think sometimes people think, well, it's just for the minister. It's just for that person, that great leader. No, it's available to you. It's for you. You have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to empower every single person believer. So that's the first thing. But the power without it being connected means nothing. And so even though you have access to the power, you have to connect to the power. How do you connect to the power of the Holy Spirit? I believe it's through prayer. We seek the Lord. We go after him. We pursue his presence. We ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, empower me. I have to connect to the Holy Spirit every day. I have to seek after him. I have to connect to him. And I have to make it, I have to be intentional in connecting with the Holy Spirit every day. And it doesn't matter if it's in your car on the way to work or if it's at home, if it's early in the morning, or if it's at one of our prayer meetings on Wednesday nights at 6:30. You have to connect. And ask the Holy Spirit, connect me to your power. Now, we have power. We're connected. There's still no light on yet. Why? Because once you have the power, you have to activate it. You have to release the power that's on the inside of you. That means that you have to share the word of God. You have to lay hands on the sick. We have to begin to utilize the power that's on the inside of us. When we know that we have the power, then all of a sudden we have to say, I'm going to release it in places that I can. Speak it over your children and begin to say, my children will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. We have to activate it. You have the power, you're connected to it, but you have to release it. The first series that Pastor Jonathan preached when he took over the church 11 years ago, the title of that series was called Activate. I love it because he understood that people have to be released into what God has for them. If you just keep it on the inside, you never see anything happen, but you have to be active. So, as I close today, what I want you to walk out of here remembering is that the Holy Spirit not only wants to lead you, not only wants to fill you, but he wants to empower you to live a godly life, to have powerful miracles, and also to live a life 
that where you can, you can begin to release and see God do some things in your life. Now, I'm reminded of my little boy. You know I'm not going to get out of here without telling a story about my little boy. <laughs> He's two now. He's awesome. His favorite thing right now is he loves playing with balloons. He likes balloons. Every kid does. What I found is, is that even people, elderly people like balloons. Everybody likes balloons. But he loves balloons. And one of the things that he loves doing is taking the balloons that has helium in it, and he likes getting at home and letting the balloon go up to the ceiling. It has a little cord on it, and he knows that he can't reach it. But he likes letting it go up to the ceiling. Why? Because he loves for me to pick him up and reach him up in the air, and he can grab the balloon. He knows he can't do it by himself. But when he's empowered, he knows he can reach the balloon. I want to encourage you, listen, without the Lord, we can't do anything. But when we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can change the world. So today, I want to pray. I want to pray that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that he begins to use us to change those around us, change ourselves, but change those around us and change our neighborhoods and change our generation. So can we stand? Holy Spirit, we ask that you empower us right now. We recognize our need for you, that we're nothing without you. We need you in our lives. We need you to lead us. We need you to fill us. And God, we need you to, Holy Spirit, we need you to empower us. Empower us to do what you called us to do. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Right now, I want to pray for miracles. If you know that you need a miracle in your body, maybe you need a miracle in your finances, there's somebody in here, you need a miracle in your, fa in your family. Maybe your marriage is going through some difficult, rough times right now. And you know that you need a miracle. You know it. You came here today saying, God, I need a miracle. I believe he can do it. Come on, let's lift our hands. Worship team, when you lead us just for a moment, and then we're going to pray for miracles. Thank you, Holy Spirit. feel faith rising in this place right now. Come on, of all of our campuses, I feel faith rising. Faith for miracles. 
Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would empower us right now. And God, I pray for miracles to begin to take place in every situation. Those of you who are needing healing in your body, you ought to begin to pray right now and ask God, God, do it again. God, I thank you that you healed in the past and God, you are healed today. God, I pray for people who, who are dealing with back pain. I pray that they would be healed in Jesus' name. I pray for people who are dealing with diabetes. I pray right now that they would be healed in Jesus' name. Somebody that's dealing with a knee pain, you've been dealing with it for years, healing right now in Jesus' name. We curse cancer right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you for a miracle taking place, complete healing in Jesus' name. Thank you for miracles, God, taking place all over this room, all over our campuses, miracles taking place. I pray that marriages are being restored right now. I pray that, that young people are coming back home. They're coming back to Jesus. I thank you that a mom or a dad is going to get a phone call over the next week or so and say, I'm coming back to Jesus from their young person. God, I pray for somebody who's needing a financial breakthrough. I pray for a miracle to happen. God, you own a cattle on a thousand hills. God, I know that you can provide. David said, I've never seen a righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. God, I know that you will take care of your people. Do a miracle. Do what only you can do. You are a way maker. You are a miracle worker. God, we thank you for what you're doing. 